following subject matter is real and only intended for mature audiences. Discretion is advised. People are dead after deputies say a man went on a shooting rampage. I knew a week before she died I was going to kill her. I can tell you the scene out there is absolutely horrific. Nobody knows where this individual may strike next. This is 10 Minute Murder. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder. Brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe. I'm the host, and I appreciate you joining today. If it's your first time listening to this podcast, I'm glad you're here, but make sure you are subscribed before the end of the podcast. My phone is ringing because I didn't turn the ringer off. Cool. It says potential spam on it. Now, I've labeled some people potential spam in my address book, so it could be one of them or it might be someone trying to get in touch with me about an extended warranty. Either way, it's going to be a no for me, dog. Anyway, make sure you're connected with 10 Minute Murder on social media. The links for that are in the show notes of this episode, or you can just as easily go to whatever social media platform you're trying to follow 10 Minute Murder on, type it into the search bar, and there it is. It's pretty simple. Also, I've noticed that more and more of you are listening on YouTube, um, so that's going to be a place that in uh, 2022, I'm going to make more of an effort to uh, post the visual content there as well. But as of right now, if you want the visual content, uh, the pictures that go along with the episodes, uh, you can follow on social media. And that's where I post all that stuff. It's not gross and graphic. It's just photos of people and places. So we're usually good there. The story today is about Henry Lee Lucas, the confession killer. And you may know this, but uh, someone requested this episode to be done on 10 Minute Murder by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And in the midst of that review, they asked for me to do this episode. And if you think for one moment that I took this request and put it ahead of some of the other requests just because they left a five-star review on Apple, you're absolutely right. I did do that. That's like a cheat code that I didn't even know that I had until then. But apparently, if you leave a five-star review and also use that space to request an episode, you jump to the front of the line. So here we are. In the 1970s, the serial killer couple Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole carried out a horrific murder spree across the United States. In the end, Henry claimed that he had killed more than 600 people, making him one of the most prodigious killers in history, at least for a short while. The life of Henry Lee Lucas was rough right from the very start. On August 23, 1936, he was born onto the raw dirt floor of his family's cabin in Blacksburg, Virginia. And often, that's seen as a blessing when a child is born into a normal home. Henry was really nothing more than an annoyance for his parents, especially for his mother, Viola. Even though she was already in her 50s, Viola was still a hardworking prostitute, and being pregnant and giving birth meant losing money. Henry's father, Anderson, was a pretty crappy parent. And not just to Henry, because he had other children spread around town. He had been making a reasonable living working on the railroads, but his career was cut short due to his heavy drinking. Also cut short was Anderson himself. One night, completely drunk, he passed out on the tracks, and as you can guess, a train rolled over him. Anderson was lucky enough to survive, but lost both of his legs. Earning the not-so-clever nickname, No Legs. Old No Legs Anderson. The accident made Henry's father quit drinking, which is great, but of course, it also made his mother the only breadwinner in the Lucas household. In Viola's head, she was now the master of the whole family. And because of that, she felt she had the right to dominate and belittle everybody else. Little Henry was taught that nothing came from his mother without some pain included. If he cried, Viola would pinch him. If he was feeding, Viola would pinch him. And when Henry was old enough to survive without breast milk, Viola put him down and never picked him back up again. In her household, affection was something that you needed to earn, not something that was automatically given. When Henry's teeth began to come in, he was often seen gnawing on pieces of woodwork. Of course, his parents didn't have a teething ring or anything like that. So because of that, Henry consumed a substantial amount of lead paint in his early life, which definitely put his brain development at great risk. As you can tell, Henry would have loved any type of social connection outside of his dysfunctional family that he could get. But unfortunately, even at school, Henry was isolated. His teachers didn't like him. Students loathed him. In the Lucas household, hygiene had never been the main priority. And because of that, Henry often smelled so bad that he had to be sat next to a window. When the school demanded that the boy's parents wash their child, 
Viola dragged Henry outside to the small pond, stripped him naked, and scrubbed him down and basically molested him at the same time. She did that while saying, quote, They want him to be a pretty smelling little girl. Then that's what we'll give them. The next day, Viola sent Henry to school wearing a floral dress, originally intended for his older sister to use at church. Henry had to sit in that dress the whole day at school before he finally returned home in tears. Unfortunately, that would not be the last time Henry's mother forced him into girls' clothing as it soon became her favorite punishment. Another way for Viola to demonstrate her authority was to put both her husband and Henry in the corner of their tiny home and force them to watch as her clients had their way with her. And you can only imagine what went through Henry's head as he stared at man after man on his mother. On top of that, Viola constantly beat up Noleg Anderson and Henry to keep them in their place. However, one day, the abuse got so bad, Henry almost lost his life. For whatever dumb, inexcusable reason, most likely because Henry didn't come fast enough when she called, Viola grabbed a two-by-four and hit Henry in the back of his head. He fell to the ground, and there he was left by Viola, thinking that once he came to, he would crawl back inside. But the next day, Henry was still laying in that same spot, unresponsive. She dragged him to the corner of the cabin where he lay for another day, completely forgotten. If it hadn't been for Viola's pimp, a guy named Uncle Bernie, Henry would have died in that corner. Unlike any other person in the Lucas household, Uncle Bernie had some basic humanity left. So as he was paying a visit to collect his cut of the takings, he picked up Henry and drove him to the hospital. Somehow, Henry survived, but as he regained consciousness a week later, he was even more miserable. He began to suffer from these horrible seizures. While Viola eased up on her son after the incident, mostly due to the urging of Uncle Bernie, irreversible damage had already been done. But just when you thought it couldn't get any worse... Henry also lost his left eye after one of his brothers accidentally struck him with a knife. Then in 1949, Henry's father died after he drug himself outside during a snowstorm and basically froze to death. No legs Anderson had clearly had enough of living under Viola's tyranny. Soon after Henry dropped out of school, he had far more exciting things to do. As Henry hit puberty, he went from not having any interest in sex to thinking about it all the time. However, he was not popular amongst the ladies in town, so Henry found other ways to satisfy his urges. Henry began hunting animals and using them as his toys, whether alive or dead. But of course, bestiality was not Henry's only questionable pastime. In 1954, at the age of 18, Henry was arrested in Richmond, Virginia, and was convicted for committing over 12 counts of burglary. He was sentenced to four years in prison and was released on September 2, 1959, after two failed escape attempts. Afterward, Henry went to live with his sister in Michigan, making his mother furious. According to Viola, her ungrateful son should have come straight back home to take care of his aging mother. She even traveled all the way to Michigan to insist that Henry move back to Blacksburg. However, what Viola did not consider was that after years of abuse and ridicule, Henry would do absolutely anything not to live with his mother ever again. And so the two argued. Things escalated, and Henry ended up hitting his mother over the head with a broom and stabbing her in the neck, causing Viola to have a fatal heart attack. Henry fled the scene but was later arrested in Ohio. Although Henry claimed self-defense, he was eventually found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 to 40 years. He was sent to Jackson State Penitentiary in southern Michigan, but after two attempted suicides, Henry was transferred to a mental facility. There, he could have spent his days until the age of 60, but due to overcrowding, Henry was released in June 1970 after serving only 10 years of his sentence. He got a second chance in life, which, however, did not mean Henry used it more wisely than he had done before. Not long after his release, Henry was back in prison. This time, it was for trying to kidnap three teenage girls at gunpoint. He was released the second time five years later, in 1975. At this point, Henry started drifting around the American South, supporting himself through various odd jobs and committing petty crime here and there. Then, in 1976, he met another drifter, a man named Otis Toole. The two hit it off right away, but not in the usual way. Both men had been raised by abusive mothers and had suffered sexual trauma at a very young age. Because of that, they shared similar interests, a mutual desire to rape and kill. Drawn together by shared childhood experience, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole began to travel across 26 states, and according to them, kill wherever they went. 
Often, the two men would take their victims and put them through rape and torture before finally murdering them. Sometimes they would mutilate the bodies, not feeling any remorse for what they had done. Henry even once joked that he crossed two state lines with someone's severed head in the back seat. However, the murderous team began to fall apart when Henry became interested in Otis's teenage niece, Becky Powell. Soon, the two became romantically involved, and they ran away together. Otis, who was left behind, became so mad by the betrayal that he spent a little over a year killing a total of nine people in six different states. Henry and Becky's relationship didn't last very long. They briefly stayed on a ranch in Ringgold, Texas, but they began to argue. Henry's response was to kill Becky, dismember her body, and scatter her remains around an isolated field. Three weeks later, on September 16, 1982, he convinced Kate Rich, the ranch owner, to join him in a search for Becky before killing her too and stuffing her body into a drainage pipe. Finally, in June 1983, Henry was arrested for possession of a deadly weapon and was soon connected to the death of the two women. After four days in jail, he pleaded guilty to the two murders. However, that was not the end of it. Not even close. For the next year and a half, Henry kept pouring out confessions to hundreds of murders. In the end, he claimed to have killed over 600 people all over the country. For a moment, Henry Lee Lucas was America's worst serial killer. As Otis Toole, who was now behind bars for burning a 64-year-old man alive, and he confirmed being present for at least 108 of the murders Henry had confessed to, authorities believed for a long time they had hit the jackpot. So many cold cases finally closed, and victims' families got their closure. That was until Henry's confessions began to prove false, one by one. In many cases, his timeline just didn't add up, and DNA testing contradicted some of his stories. Henry's credibility took its final hits when he began to confess to killing Jimmy Hoffa, supplying the poison used in the mass suicide of the People's Temple in Jonestown, and murdering people in Japan and Spain. On top of that, it was revealed that some task force members had provided Henry with evidence of the cases and basically led him to confess. In return for those confessions, Henry received special treatment in prison, which motivated him to keep on going with the sham. Soon enough, police had to admit that they had made a mistake, and most of Henry's stories were nothing but fantasy. Henry later boasted about what he had done, saying, quote, I made the police look stupid. I was out to wreck Texas law enforcement. Nevertheless, Henry Lee Lucas was still convicted of 11 homicides and sentenced to death for the 1979 murder of an unidentified woman in Texas known only as Orange Sox. Yet it was again proved Henry could not have been present at the time of the death of Orange Sox, as he was working at that time in a different state. In the end, Henry's sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment by Texas Governor George W. Bush. He died in a Huntsville, Texas prison from natural causes on March 12, 2001, at the age of 64. To this day, we don't know for sure how many people Henry Lee Lucas murdered alone and together with Otis Toole. And the fact that he did not show any remorse and was ready to put numerous broken families through his twisted game for attention made Henry Lee Lucas more frightening than the actual number of his victims. That's 10 Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. If there's a story that you would like for me to cover on 10 Minute Murder, you can email it to me, 10minutemurder at gmail.com. Send me a direct message on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or like the person that requested this episode, you can rate and review on Apple Podcasts and work it in there somehow. And here's what that one said. I love this podcast so much. It's all I listen to in the car on the way to school or work. I don't know exactly how requests work, but I would love if Joe did an episode on Henry Lee Lucas. I don't think he's done one yet, but my grandfather actually gave him a ride after he escaped from jail. He didn't know who he was at the time, though. Thank you, Joe. So there you go. If you're new to this podcast, make sure you subscribe before you go, and that way you won't miss any future episodes of 10-Minute Murder. Thanks for listening. Be safe, and have a good night.